Welcome back. Circular Strategies Conference here at the at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. After uh, the first keynotes by Helga Weiss and Joseph Ricard, yeah. with the first um, panel, we have three impulse statements now by three completely different positions. And then we will have a short panel discussion, roughly 30, 40 minutes, where we will also invite you to ask your questions, either through uh, the chat function uh, at the Zoom, uh, on the Zoom platform, or you just raise your blue hand, and then we can see that you have a question. Or when you are also joining through YouTube or through Facebook, we have some people in the staff that helps us to channel the questions and to bring them to me so I can host and facilitate uh, them as well. And then one, we start with the small scale. So reuse of building components and we really start with the small scale. So we look at the materials, at the brick stones, take brick stone please as a symbol for many, many more materials. And we start uh, by looking at the Building material itself at the component and to see what strategies there are by uh, scientists, by architects, by designers uh, to help us in finding a, a circular strategy in that. We start with Carola Stabauer. Uh, she's an architect from um, Vienna, partner at Enstar Architects. She's teaching at the University uh, of Technology in Vienna. She's been teaching there for eight years now. And she's also one of the founding members of the Harvest Map, which is a cooperative for the exchange of re reusable billing materials and circular economy. Carola, we're looking forward to your first impulse. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I just want to, to say something about this because uh, uh, here are three institutions uh, 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 beside my name. So it's Ensta, you already said this, I, I'm working as an architect together with uh, two colleagues and at the Harvest Map, I'm, I'm a founding member. Uh, and the re really important parts for this presentation I want to do now are the Harvest Map and the TU, TU, TU Vienna, uh, the Technical University of Vienna, because this uh, part I want to show you um, experiments we did with the students. So this, um, I will show you mainly three workshops, two of them I organized with my colleague uh, of the Technical University, uh, Hannah Hofschneider, in cooperation with Materialnomaden, with Peter Kneidinger from the Materialnomaden. So this is the focus um, yeah, of these two projects. And then another uh, workshop uh, I did together with my colleague, uh, Susanne Detlefsen, but it's also a cooperation of uh, Technical University and uh, the Materialnomaden. Uh, the first uh, workshop we did also, we invited Søren Nielsen from Denmark, from Copenhagen. Uh, He's an architect of Van Kunsten, um, and I will talk about the title of the workshops later then. I will start with, um, uh, with this term, waste. <laughs> and circular, circularity is, uh, is based on the fact that there is no waste. And uh, of course, it's true, we have to call it resources. Um, um, yeah, that's an uh, important, important fact because what we all already heard in, in these introductions uh, uh, quite a lot of why we have to do with this, uh, why we have to, to work with, uh, with reuse and that uh, small part I will talking about uh, is really this um, practical implementation and, and possibilities to to deal with reuse, to experiment with uh, reuse uh, in a very specific way. Um, so I am not really want to talk about the, the, the legal term of, uh, of waste. I think a lot of other people are, are, are dealing with that and in, in the so-called Abfallwirtschaft or waste management. Um, 
for example, a, a product becomes waste as soon as um, it is intended to dispose of it. I want to stick at this question, is waste an opportunity for architectural design? Uh, because the central content of this uh, workshop was to uh, reassess um, the things or the products and to give them a new name and to transfer it to a new um, position, a new uh, valuable position. So um, the two terms uh, of architecture and waste um, in general far apart in their social assessment. Um, and we consider this um, differentiation to be excellent, um, it could be an excellent uh, design proposal yeah, or potential, design potential. Yeah, objects and situations uh, that provoke an action have great potential in the development of design and design strategies, we believe. So that's the reason. Uh, I will guide you this, to this lecture also uh, with the term of waste. The other questions, yeah, um, we ask ourselves and we ask the students uh, in the workshops, um, can we use, um, can we deal with, uh, uh, with this uh, kind of constructions for, for architecture? Uh, I now switch uh, in, the, in the agenda. So there are still no more images, but they are following now. Uh, but uh, what uh, I want to talk about is where we can find this material. We call it the material bank, material bank in the city. Uh, about the mapping, uh, uh, how, how we can uh, um, uh, analyze the materials, uh, what are the frameworks, afterwards, what, what are the, the process and the, what the, the results of the design. Um, and so on. Then I show you now three images of um, of very big uh, buildings uh, built in the 80s. Uh, so this is a, a big amount in uh, the already uh, um, dismantled, mostly dismantled now. So Vienna is is growing, and uh, uh, Vienna is uh, being demolished as well. So this is a, a material bank we should use. Uh, we uh, uh, mainly already did. I go on. This uh, building is already new now. You you know all Vienna people knew, knew this perhaps. But I want to talk about this building. It's the Quellgasse in the north of Vienna because this was one of the buildings uh, where we did the workshops. Uh, just um, some images. Uh, I try to go on uh, a bit quicker now. Uh, what the Materialnomaden, and I also said at the beginning that it's a, a cooperation from the TU and the, uh, uh, so the uh, cooperation, uh, the design of the workshops and the Materialnomaden itself. So the Materialnomaden uh, at the same time um, uh, 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 did a lot of, of dismantling, uh, uh, the so called, uh, so, so during and before the mineral dismantling, this is important for, perhaps in that uh, case a large amount of the so-called Störstoffe, this is now the German um, term, uh, were released uh, and uh, were available for reuse. So this, this is Störstoffe, it's, it's wood and, and, and metal and so on. Uh, it's in, in our impact, it's not the Störstoff uh, and it, it is a, a very um, important and valuable material. So just already pulled down. This is the other building we uh, was able to use. It was going to be uh, uh, demolished. This is the building in uh, in the Ukraine. It's, inter it's interesting because it's a, um, it's a, a hybrid. I could say parts of the building are already demolished. Parts of the building are still in use. So the production is going on. The other part you can see here uh, is uh, um, would be renovated uh, and is in use from a lot of uh, uh, creative industries. Going on now, 
Okay, so we are going to the mapping. What have we done in these buildings? We, we, we did the research. We had in, in this kind of building, we had 15 students. It was March, it was quite really cold. Um, and the students, uh, uh, yeah, analyzed uh, what we have seen in the building. Um, I go on a, a bit. This was the other building, the second one, the Grachovina, uh, as well, in, uh, situated in Vienna. Uh, this uh, uh, big production halls, this was uh, uh, already big production halls because it's already demolished now. So we measured, uh, we uh, investigated, uh, uh, did the investigation of the material and the connection. What can I do with the material? Um, yeah, I was looking about, is it treasure or is it a treasure hunt? Yeah? In, in that case, in the Ukraine, we had a big treasure hunt um, and we already, or the students mainly, um, did a, a, a was looking for the, the quantity of the potential of reuse material. So I'm not looking to you, I see. <laughs> it's just because I have this, uh, the wrong, uh, wrong screen now. Uh, the framework, just very few. You, you know, we have a framework. Everybody of you uh, can mention that. Uh, it's part of the demand, but it's now perhaps not that important for the student work. So I will switch it, it's more for um, economical uh, uh, decision. So we, we go on uh, to, the, to the design for this assembly, but uh, uh, Karen Wright also was talking uh, and uh, some other guys in, in the morning, um, because that's how can we learn this, uh, that we, we think about uh, the future so that we, the one hand, we want to use uh, material uh, right now, and the other hand, we want to design uh, connections and constructions which work further on in the, uh, yeah, as long as possible. This was the, uh, uh, this building in the, in the, in the Mensa, we, we had the possibility to make a big workshop. This was the other building as well, so I switch a bit students uh, just tried uh, to do and to ask uh, the material what it want to be, what it is possible, what can I, uh, in which uh, transformation I can bring this material. Uh, yeah, this was really, an, uh, these guys found a, a, lot, a lot of uh, um, cupboards, <laughs> I would say, yes. Uh, but a big amount of it, and this was also interesting that, because we are thinking about structures, that uh, case, perhaps the amount is not that much, but uh, which which parts of the building are interesting that it's not just an object, a design object. I do this reuse, so uh, uh, it should be an it should be an, a strategy. Strategy. So therefore, I I need a big amount to 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 think about um, more than just the object. In that case, it's a uh, they've got our telephone and network cables. Um, doing some networks. I switch to the, how many minutes I have left? <laughs> no, I just uh, go on. Uh, so now I switch to the products, I would say, with the students, we did uh, um, the research before, then we did this one-to-one uh, uh, -one, uh, uh, mock-ups, I uh, would say. And after this, but I won't show them, um, they also uh, designed architectural projects out of these uh, systems they, they generated in one-to-one. -one. For example, this uh, in Rachovina that, uh, was um, a window production company, a lot of window frames and grasses uh, could be found, and these students uh, designed a um, window frame object that could, could be wise uh, as well. Um, in that case, uh, at the um, Kreilgasse, I had shown before, uh, already demolished. Um, I think Carola, it may was I about... We have three more minutes. Uh, so you have to try <laughs> either you tell us a little bit or you just uh, go and stroll through the beautiful images. Yes. So that's up to you. But three more minutes left. Okay. Sorry. 
I didn't check the time that much, so we just looked to this. Uh, this uh, they found some. Uh, yes, this uh, perhaps interesting. <laughs> um, these are standard formats, so um, they did a, a shading system uh, and thought about that this could be 150 square meters of of them. They can design is the amount they have uh, found in the building. Um, yes, they found uh, uh, lighting systems and uh, also generated a shading system. These are ceiling panels. Lots of them are available in that building, and they're also system format, so you also can uh, um, scale it up. This was the uh, experiment um, we have seen before, and it's also a shading system uh, put out of it. Um, in that case, a lot of uh, cupboards uh, was designed to a um, um, structuring system. Yeah, so I'm ready with the students' images effect on our climate. Therefore, we had, perhaps this is very important uh, from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation because uh, uh, um, it's, she, she says, uh, or the foundation says that 80% uh, uh, is responsible, 80% uh, of our, um, what we can, uh, of our environmental impact uh, is in the design. So we have a, a big, we can, as designers and architects, we can quite really uh, do and deal a lot. Uh, Karin Reit also uh, thought about the operational and uh, energy and the embodied energy. So I just want to talk about the third point because it's very in interesting. The image is quite small. Uh, but here you can see how important uh, now the embedded energy, also to, to think about the embedded energy, is uh, in uh, values in the to to the operational energy. So the orange one is a building quite standard, not that much um, high uh, uh, high energy building. But in the, the yellow one is um, yeah, and high. So I'm missing the word now. High impact, it's not an, an, an What's the word in German? An, an, <laughs> in German, it's an hoch effizientes, a high efficient building. Thank you. High but not that, uh, impo uh, not that um, difficult. But you can see if it's uh, like the yellow one, a very high uh, efficient uh, building in the operation energy, then uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in Verhältnis, uh, uh, the embedded energy would be quite very much um, as a, it more it is more important to think about it huh? perhaps I can okay. yeah some benefits but here I just leave this don't clue make it re re reversible that's what we want to go on oh okay that's the very important second part I want to show but I have to switch through and perhaps I you yeah, have to show us now your very very last bullet point okay What's so the most then important? I leave I had two other uh, projects uh, I was too slow I'm sorry but this perhaps I leave just this and it is also it's, it's very important for you or, or, or enough perhaps if you see this uh, um, this homepage uh, uh, links uh, because uh, if, uh, as a student, or as perhaps you are not able to go to one of these buildings uh, and so on, uh, as, as we uh, did in, in these two uh, workshops. Uh, but these platforms, uh, uh, Rotor is in, Belg in, in Belgium, Genbuk is in Copenhagen, Denmark, and SuperU Studios, or the platform is Uxgard in, in, in the Netherlands, and Materialomaden. Harvest map uh, is situated, situated in Vienna. So these are important, uh, one of them, there are a lot more of them. Uh, we use platforms where you can go in, you can uh, di digital and mostly uh, also um, uh, direct in, 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 in a store or a shop. You can buy the um, used material and you, uh, it's possible to do your own design, design in this small scale. Now I'm in small scale panel um, version, 
and to think about the bigger scale as well. So Thank you. I have to end up here. <laughs> I cannot go uh, more in this uh, description of these four very important I want to thank you a lot. I will not ask you anything at the moment right now because we will have the panel discussion anyway uh, at the end of the first small scale project. So thanks for that. After having an, a short insight into the situation in Vienna and Carola also showed us what is going on in the Netherlands in Belgium and in Denmark, we will now switch over to Switzerland. Jan Brütting from the EPFL uh, in Lausanne, from the Col Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne in Switzerland, uh, will have the next uh, speech. Carola, may I just ask ah, you? Yeah, sorry. I'm already. Perfect. And he Thank says, you. well, is it form follows function, or is it function follows form, or form follows beauty, or whatever? No. Jan says, form follows avail availability. So um, he will tell us something about uh, designing load-bearing structures through component reuse in Switzerland, about some projects that he's been working on recently. And Jan, are you with us? Yes, I can see your screen already. Looking forward to your lecture. Go ahead. OK, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for organizing this wonderful um, symposium today. And thanks to all the organizers for, for making this uh, possible, even though it's a currently a, a very hard situation to do these things. Um, as said, I am from EPFL in Switzerland. I'm a PhD student. Um, EPFL has some outposts throughout Switzerland, and I'm located um, doing my research as a PhD student in Fribourg, which is a small satellite campus of EPFL. And I'm a PhD student in the Structural Exploration Lab, which is led by Professor Corentin Fivé. And we're kind of situated in between civil and architectural engineering. So we all either have a background in civil engineering or architecture. And at the moment, we're already eight PhD students and some researchers, and mainly focusing on circular economy and the built environment. And I want to start uh, my presentation with sharing you a small story from Switzerland. Here you can see a timber bridge that is or was built in 1810 in Switzerland, in Eglisau over the River Rhine, which is a little bit north of Zurich in this case. And you can see that this bridge was built in 18, um, 1810, and it was spanning over the River Rhine. But then the river was dammed for an electricity power plant. So 100 years later, in 1919, the structure had to be disassembled because the river would have been risen by seven meters in height. And so the bridge had to make way. But in these days, uh, short after the First World War, material was scarce. And it was not just the idea to throw away or burn the timber, but instead in a two kilometer nearby premise in Rheinau, the timber was actually reused to build a very nice um, barn uh, one year after the deconstruction of the bridge. And then we were looking if this barn is still um, actually in place. And we can see that uh, last year when we visited this place, that this barn is still existing and in very good shape. So what I want to show with this uh, short story is that here you can see a already 100 year old building which is actually made out of components that are 200 years old. So we can, or in this case, it was possible to reuse structural elements uh, for multiple service lives and to keep them uh, in use for a very long time without any, any technical defects or any problems. Um, but what is the situation today? It's a big question mark because we've shifted far away from this um, material design to uh, current economy in building construction, which produces large amounts of waste. For example, in the European Union, one third of the waste comes from construction and demolition. At the same time, the building sector uses about 50% of the raw material use worldwide. And at the same time, about one third of global CO2 emissions are related to buildings. And we've seen shortly before that these um, CO2 emissions can be split into two parts, the operational um, energy and carbon that comes from, for example, heating and cooling the place, like a building, 
or the embodied part, which is um, for making um, construction materials and products. And what we've also seen in the talk before, through technical standards and advancements and also um, legislation and rating schemes like LEED or MINASHI in Switzerland, um, operational energy has been successfully reduced, but not much attention has been given to the embodied share. And when we look a little bit closer into the embodied share, we can see that load bearing systems, so structures, are really highly um, responsible for these embodied shares. We can see, for example, that in office buildings, um, about three quarters of the embodied energy in carbon is due to the load bearing system. So the superstructure, the foundations, and also the construction um, processes. And that's what we are interested in, to really um, look into load bearing systems because they contribute a lot to these embodied shares. So it's highly relevant to reduce their impact. And one opportunity to reduce the impact of load bearing systems is to shift from our linear make use dispose economy to a circular one which introduces um, service cycles in the in the in the service life of products and what i'm particularly focusing on in my research and during my phd was the reuse of structural components so reusing individual load bearing elements for example beams or bars um, because it has certain advantages um, reusing structural components makes best use of already existing functions. It reduces significantly the input for raw materials. We can avoid reprocessing energy. So for example, if you would reuse a steel element, you don't need to remelt it and make a new steel element, but you can avoid all this energy and also reuse prevents waste. And there's a few examples we've seen many in the, in the previous presentations and there in particular, I've put together some references um, on load bearing structures that are made of reclaimed element. I only want to pick out one uh, prominent example that you see at the bottom right, which is the London Olympic Stadium, which was built um, for the Olympics in 2012. And actually, 2,500 tons of this um, roof truss are secondhand uh, steel pipeline tubes. So more than a quarter of the roof truss is made from secondhand material. And this is really a significant and big building and it was possible to reuse structural elements. So it's not just an idea, but it has been done also in practice and even more in history. Um, maybe you've seen a small installation that we did in our lab. It was this elastic gridshell made out of skis, which was a first start with students and researchers to um, start the research and to, to get a feeling about um, designing structures with reclaimed components. And then what my um, particular research really focused on is this design process and the reason for my talk, the form follows availability. So if we look at the conventional design of structures today, you would first define a layout, so a topology and geometry of a structure. And then you would assume that you could just um, manufacture all the remaining or the necessary parts. And you just manufacture what is necessary. Whereas if you want to design structures um, from a set of reclaimed components, for example, um, the process is inverted. So you have to start your design with a set of available elements. You know their cross-section and their length and the material, and you want to design a structure from them. So the form, the geometry, and also the um, topology is a result of the existing components. And with that, I want to show you some methods that we developed um, in, in the lab, which is basically based on uh, structural optimization methods. So the idea to optimize a structure for a given set of boundary conditions, for example, support conditions and loads. And I want to show this through a short video, um, these methods and algorithms that we developed. So you have a design problem, you have a structure that you, you want to span a certain distance and you have given loads. And on the right, you have a set of available components and you run an optimization to find the best use of these components. So how to cut them and how to place them best in the structure. And this is done under um, some uh, limit state. So for example, you check the stresses in the member and also the deflection of your structure. And then you get the best structure from the available elements. And in a second step, you can also optimize the geometry such that um, for example, you match the structure shape with the available elements. 
to reduce, for example, the cutting of elements. And what is um, important in this case is that we do a life cycle assessment and we want to directly minimize in this optimization the environmental impact of structures made of reused elements against um, structures made of new components. So the LCA takes, for example, into account the impacts from deconstructing buildings versus when we consider a benchmark structure made of new material, the impacts from new steel production. And when we apply this method, for example, here to a single span truss with um, three different stocks, we can see that optimizing the structure for a different stock configuration also gives a, a different um, geometry as a result. And at the bottom in blue, you can see the benchmark. So this is the best practice design that we could today do today with new elements. And when we compare these um, two systems, we can see that, for example, the structures made of reused elements, they have a higher mass than the minimum weight benchmark because, for example, there's not enough elements with light cross sections available in the stock. But when we compare the life cycle environmental impact, we can see that through, you, through reusing uh, structural steel elements in this case, we can reduce, for example, the embodied energy by 48%. And this is mainly due, for example, because we avoid this remelting of steel. So the new structure is made out of new steel, which needs a lot of energy whereas reuse only needs, for example, deconstruction and transport processes. Um, I want to show with you a small example where this method of optimization has been applied. Here, the idea was to take elements from electric pylons as a stock. And then first, the, uh, that was done by a student that I was supervising. Um, the structural elements that are available in an electric pylon have been um, inventory, so the length, the cross-section, and the material, so you get an overview of what is available. And then we ran this optimization algorithm that you saw in the video, where this time the idea was to find a geometry where all the elements could be reused with full length. So you would only need to custom manufacture some connection plates, and you could even reuse the existing bolt holes in the elements. And here you can see the final design that was the output of the um, optimization method. Um, so you see that um, how the elements from the pylons are taken and put into the, into the structural system. And at the end, this was basically a new design concept for the train station in Lausanne, actually. Um, one additional point, because so far I've only shown you examples where structures are made either of reused elements or of new elements. Um, sometimes it's not possible to make a structure only out of 100% reused elements because, for example, you don't have enough elements available or they don't fit, for example, the, the loads that you experience in the structure. So it might be best to mitigate between, for example, reuse and new production. And we've extended these optimization methods to allow this idea. And you can see at the top, for example, the structure made of only new elements where you have, for example, a very thin bottom cord that is in tension, and at the bottom, the structure made of only reused elements, where the, because there's only, for example, thick elements available, they would be put into the bottom cord, even though it's not necessary. And in the middle, you find the optimal structure that combines reused and new elements, where you can see that some members are replaced with new ones, and instead the structure, for example, becomes much lighter, and the environmental impact is also reduced. So when we look, for example, into the um, distribution of environmental impact in these structures, in the new system, you can see that, uh, as I said before, the biggest share is coming from new production of steel. In the reuse case with 100% reused elements, the biggest share is coming from using machines in deconstructing buildings and making um, reclaimed elements available. And in the optimal case, you have a mitigation between new production and deconstruction impacts, and you reduce slightly further the environmental impact. And that was the part of designing structures from a stock of available elements, for example, coming from deconstructed buildings. Now I want to briefly show you the other idea of turning this around and designing a structure for reuse. So can we design something today that is capable to be transformed for multiple uses in future. So you can think this as, as the inverse process, but we still use the same optimization methods and algorithms. We just adapt them to fit this idea. And 
I want to start um, basically with, with this question. Um, can we design three structures that are of different shape, that are non-modular, and that have a completely different topology or maybe function, like a shell for shelter or here this tower to support some loads? And the question that we raised is what would be the optimal kit of parts as we term it? So what would be the bars that we need to build these structures and what would be the joints so that these individual elements here can be used for multiple assemblies? And you see here directly a result. Um, for example, those elements that have the same color, have the same length, so you can replace them within the structures. And another idea in this project was to produce reusable joints. So you want one joint that fits, for example, three node positions in the three structures, where the idea was to have these specific connection patterns that are then combined into, into one bespoke joint. And the whole process I want to show to you now quickly through a video. Um, so this was a pavilion project that we did for an expo at the IASS symposium last year in Barcelona. And we term these pavilions one to three, so one kit of parts to three structures. And we developed this um, form finding algorithm that allows the simultaneous design of the three systems. And then you can see that you need only half of the number of bars to build the three structures. Then there is an analysis that members are sized for the worst case loading that they experience among the three structures. And as I said before, this idea of combining different nodes into one joint. So you kind of try to find a position of these holes on a spherical surface that they don't overlap. And then this joint is made to be connected for three specific nodes, as you could see through this animation. And then you have your whole kit of parts to assemble, for example, the shell structure. You can take it apart again. You have the same stock. Now you take a few different elements or different joints, you assemble the second structure, you disassemble it again. And then lastly, you assemble this structure, um, the column, uh, where all joints, for example, have been used because this is the structure with the most number of nodes. And then we also manufactured all these parts in our lab. So you start with the joints. Uh, the first is to drill this, we call it master hole manually. So every joint has one, one hole that gives an orientation in space. There's also a small number to it. And then we added these threaded inserts that were later used to connect the bars via bolts. But also this is useful because now you can connect every sphere, sphere to a industrial robotic arm, which will allow you later to drill these uh, special hole patterns. So it's Every of these, in this case, 54 joints is unique. And we use this robot to very simply just drill this 3D spatial pattern um, of holes. And there is a marking system with colors inside the holes that you know that which hole belongs to which sphere. And again, uh, which hole belongs to which structure, sorry. And again, we had to manually insert all these um, threads. We custom 3D printed some connecting parts between the spheres and the tubes. The tubes were then also manually cut from um, two meter standard length um, plexiglass rods of three different um, diameters to adapt the section also to the forces that they experience in the structure, but also to allow a minimum packing because we can slide elements into each other. And that allowed a very small packaging volume because we had to transport everything to Barcelona and assemble the structures actually there. And lastly, here you see an assembly and disassembly sequence of the three structures in our lab. And we saw that it was really very precise and very easy to assemble the three structures and it fit perfectly well so that multiple joints could be used at multiple node positions and the bars of the same length could be also reused among structures. So in total, we manufactured about half the components, 170, um, 170 bars for building, for example, three structures with 350 members. So you reduce your material input by about half. And 
with that, I want to conclude my talk that what we have developed are optimization methods to allow for a conceptual design of structures um, with reused elements for both cases, design from reuse and design for reuse. It is very important to see this as conceptual tools because also in the early design stages, you have still the most influence on your design later. We've seen throughout this work in the recent years that based on even also taking realistic case studies, for example, the one with the disassembled electric pylons that through reuse, we always achieve about 60% environmental impact reduction, for example, reducing embodied energy and carbon uh, with these methods. And also these methods were applicable to realistic uh, cases shown, for example, um, taking stocks from the electric pylons and other buildings in Switzerland. And also we have realized these pavilions. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Questions will come afterwards, but uh, I'm very astonished. You seem to really have lots of fun at the Structural Exploration Lab at, at the EPF at Lausanne. So it sounds like fun uh, whenever uh, I take a sabbatical from uh, doing facilitations and writing articles for a newspaper, I'll join you. Yeah, so, welcome. thank you. Uh, coming to the third uh, impulse, Annette Hillebrand. Annette Hillebrand is architect in Cologne, and she is also professor for building construction design and material science at the Bergische Universität in uh, Wuppertal. And she's member in many, many, many uh, councils and advisory boards. Uh, for example, Urban Mining Association, uh, Resource Foundation, German Sustainable Building Council, and so on. And she has initiated a material library and was awarded the Urban Mining Award and many, many more stuff. But I don't want to talk about that because that would cut in a little bit the speech time of Annette. Uh, we're looking forward to your speech, Urban Mining Design, Circular Economy Building Strategy. Whatever that means, I'm looking forward to hearing that. Annette, go ahead. Thank you, Annette. Um, hopefully, we will design for more than just for the next 50 years. That's <laughs> our goal. Uh, now, Lukas Alna will also join us. Because you still have to unmute. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Lukas Alna, I told you at the beginning uh, when we opened the conference, is one of the two guys who who really helped in, in participating in, in contributing to this uh, conference today. You did the organization. Uh, Lukas Alna, uh, architect, um, has okay. started architecture at the uh, Arts Academy in Stuttgart and also here at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. And you'll join us now for the discussion as a respondent. So uh, as a respondent, my first question to you would be, uh, what was new for you here in this first small scale panel uh, from the lectures from Carola, from Jan and from Annette? Uh, was there a big surprise that you heard? Was, that, was there maybe an issue where so far your experience was different than what you heard now? Um, Thanks, first of all, for, for these inspiring lectures. Um, uh, I think I have a couple of questions, um, but um, and some, yes, some ideas uh, uh, that I didn't, or we came up d during, uh, whilst listening to, to what you were talking about. And um, uh, to, to pick out one, one of these questions, um, and that maybe refers most to what uh, Jan was showing, um, that mediating the reuse and the optimum of, um, of, of a newly constructed uh, structure made me uh, question what, what's an optimum to begin with. And, um, and what it, but, but what it creates structurally, um, this sort of redundancy of, um, of material in a construction that could other, otherwise be more lightweight, maybe could offer also flexibility for, for other purposes, structural purposes. Because what you have, I think, addressed is a very specific load case scenario or, or 
specific, say, um, usage structurally. Um, but if, if through a reuse, there is some sort of almost dysfunctional redundancy in the structure, maybe that offers uh, a possibility for, for reprogramming. And that maybe refers back to, um, or refers to what uh, um, Annette was saying, that um, in, in, in terms of a skeleton um, uh, principle that could be, um, could be say the providing main structure to, to insert multiple functions and that could change over time. So um, Thank you. I think these sort of, um, um, let's say trade-offs or sometimes things it seems as to, that appear as the trade-off at first might also uh, viewed from a different perspective might become a potential um, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this context. Okay, thanks. Carola, can I also ask you to unmute your microphone? Thank you. So, Annette, Carola and Jan, uh, from, from the different perspectives that you showed us um, on what you're working right now, would you say that these are still pilots? Are we still in a pioneer phase? Uh, the work you do, if it's a harvest map, it's, if it's working on different joints, or if it's thinking about new uh, ways of putting structures together without producing uh, waste of the future. Do you think that we're still in a pioneer phase or do you have the impression that all of that that you're working on is already a little bit of a reality today? Who would like to start? Carola, Jan, what about you? Do you think that you're still doing pioneer work or do you see your work already as a part of uh, reality? Um, so if I go on, uh, I think it's uh, it's a it's a bit of a mixture. So all of us, uh, in a way, are pioneers. But uh, the colleagues we are visiting and uh, the the offices and and also platforms uh, we had uh, yeah, visited as well. Uh, most of them are already on the way since uh, 20 years, 10 years at least. But uh, some of them 20 years, as uh, um, we have seen in the keynote too, too as well. Um, and uh, I wanted to show uh, afterwards, but I didn't have enough time, also projects from Denmark. So Denmark, I think, is in, in the Netherlands as well, this, uh, too, uh, and the North. Uh, they, they have done a lot of steps uh, further on, and perhaps in, in the middle uh, of Europe, we have to go on <laughs> in that way. But uh, especially the, in Denmark, there are two projects, the Circle House. It's, um, uh, uh, it's a big, big residential now uh, um, being built uh, till 2003. Uh, and the other one from Lenea Group, uh, a very, very big um, project based on, on the uh, UN Sipton SDGs. Uh, so these are quite big scaled projects. They are in a way not the standard, but they are also pioneers. So I think we have to, we have to go on with, with the, with the um, experiments. They are not already done. So I, I, I like to become uh, this kind of uh, discussion or this kind of design strategy as a standard. Yeah? And I think I think someone of you in, in the morning already said this before, this could be in five years. Uh, it's, it's, it's what you said, yeah. I think, yeah. Um, so I think we are in, in, a, in, in between or we are um, switching to this uh, standard. Yeah? Yeah, we sure have to go on. Jan, you showed us um, this this project with the uh, reuse of material, uh, the train station hall in Lausanne. Have you ever been confronted with a project that's similar to that, that's already been realized? Um, if, I don't know if you know um, the architecture firm in situ in, in Switzerland. Um, they are currently building a structure or their office building from from reclaimed steel elements. So that is, it's an office building. It's not the, the same, let's say, size or, or shape as this train station roof. But yes, there is there is currently work going on in that direction. Mm -hmm. I I have I want to add something. 
I think I want, I have a question to basically okay. all of you addressing going in the similar in a similar dire into a similar direction, which is what is what do you see as the say problems on one hand, but also the possible potential incentives to change the building. I don't want to say industry, but maybe culture towards say the circularity. Um, um, because if, m m looking at ca what Carola showed, it all had still this sort of touch of the self-made of the DIY um, uh, efforts also in this one keynote that we've seen where um, it, um, it would take a lot of energy to invest and a lot of motivation in order to achieve something. But so what do you see as, yeah, problems, but also chances to get there? One part we have to fight against here is industry, because if it's the harvest map or um, Annette, as you just uh, said, we need a law immediately, or if it's reusing old steel structure from those uh, electric things to do a train haul, uh, we do fight against industry. And of course, there is a huge lobby and their interest is to sell produce and products and elements and materials. So how would it be possible to invite those, let's say, enemies who have different interests than we do and to, to invite them and to find a solution and compromise together? Would you have ideas? Are you trusting? I guess you have to somehow um, try to get it, get it done. And um, I mean, I'm focusing on a particular aspect in my work, which is the design tools and something. And there I'm trying to, to share them um, with students. And that is also one, one important thing maybe is to, to raise new, new generations of architects, civil engineers. And we're trying to put circular design also already in the curriculum in EPFL. And I think we have more from EPFL today too. Um, so, it has to go also through the, the new generations of students, I guess. And in my case, that would be, for example, showing these methods to students and supervising master students um, as a researcher. I'm not directly approaching at the moment industry to, to show them uh, optimization algorithms or something that's maybe too too specific. But what we can do is to, to um, make students think differently. Thank you. I saw that Sergio Porta and also I think Bebel Müller have questions. So please go ahead. Who would like to start? No, Sergio. I don't have a question. I, how how did you see that? I don't I don't have a question. I'm afraid. Ah, okay, that's fine. Uh, I just saw something rising up. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> um, him, I think that was him entering, coming okay. back. Ah, you were entering. Um, but I want to add something too. Again. Um, I think I'm, I'm an optimist and I believe, I strongly believe that there is some potential and Carola was mentioning it, that this sort of working with reuse um, is provoking interpretation, I think you said. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a chance for say a new approach to, to architecture in general. Maybe it's not about doing the same structures, the same principle, the same um, things uh, we have been doing for the past decades, um, just in a different, more complicated way, more expensive way, but maybe through um, embracing, uh, uh, say, this design for disassembly and so on, all, all these principles we've talked about, maybe a new type of, um, uh, yeah, the built environment could could be achieved, and that also maybe uh, goes towards what Jan uh, is doing. That new structural typologies could emerge by addressing uh, the uh, use of reclaimed parts um, or a, a joint culture um, that's that's using disassembled parts that can be disassembled, mm. or repurposing materials in general. I think there is there is a potential, and maybe that could at the end of the day also lead to a business a new business model, and that could be an incentive for the industry. Mm. That, that's why I was talking a bit too, uh, too long uh, at the beginning about waste. Uh, I want to, uh, to end up uh, 
And so I see now what is the chance the, the chance uh, we can uh, go on further is to make it sexy uh, and perhaps to 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 find another term for resources or waste. Resources. Would you have an idea? What so term much. would that be? Pardon? What term would that be? Do you have an idea? Uh, no. It's, it would be end up with this question. I don't have an answer as well, but it's waste has uh, an, an, uh, an association uh, and resources as well. Yeah? Resources has an association uh, that much with uh, the, the waste management. So, and to, to bring it, uh, to, to make it more sexy and to have fun and to bring it in a position that uh, architects and designers want to deal with it, I think it's the chance that we, uh, uh, it comes um, to the bottom, <laughs> I would say, as a, uh, and we can in this small scale I, I'm talking about, but also in a big scale. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jan showed us what they're doing at the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne. Uh, Lucas, you were also uh, uh, involved into some experimental projects with joints with reused materials. Um, I, I, I don't want to go into the depth of those projects, but yeah, can you tell us how the uh, response by the industry was? So how did they react? Um, were, they fun, uh, um, were they happy with that? Or did you also have to struggle? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna answer this. In my case, it was really more, uh, Mm, a cu cultural experiment, more on the end of, of artistic research, less than uh, mm, more in an earlier, in a say pre-state before entering say applicable solutions to 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 for the for the uh, building industry. But um, we have been trying to use state-of-the-art technologies and work with what's already implemented in the industry, and I think technology to some of these um, uh, intentions that we uh, have formulated now, technology might be the key to, to address some of the complexity that we are facing. Mm -hmm. Like one, one, one instance, for example, uh, uh, or one topic we've worked with was using reusing parts that are all different, non-standard elements. And that's not even lengths of, of, of members, but in our case, it was Forked branches of wood yeah, that are natural that are nat natural material, and um, uh, yeah, and and you could cope with that complexity, I believe, only using digital technology. And I think that's that's also a chance forward. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And to yeah, thank you. We have a question by Alex. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name correctly, um, Muresan. Um, if we design uh, buildings to, uh, to be more um, sustainable for the future, so if we have them as a circularity uh, uh, building, um, will, well, it's a long question, let me check. Um, will, will there also be more adaptable over time or uh, and um, more, the, well, I read it to you because I, I tried to make it a little bit shorter, but that's not that easy as a facilitator. So do you think that if we design to reuse and implement circularity, we will be able to make buildings more adaptable over time, a more dynamic built environment, and be able to implement the novel technologies and adapt to the unforeseeable human needs? So in future times, please ask us shorter questions that makes life easier for me. So will we be able to adapt our long-term circularity buildings to unforeseeable human needs? Yes or no? And what do we have to do in order to do so? Who would like to start? Jana would like to include you. Um, so I guess this, this question points into um, that part that I've shown in the, in the second part of my presentation to design something uh, for reuse. So um, because we cannot maybe always design something only taking existing elements, but we still need to build new buildings today. So at least um, make them adaptable for, for future needs. That's that's um, how I understand it. 
and um, this could be, for example, being able to to rearrange um, ground plan, ground plans or or column layouts or something in the building. So to to have this kit of parts idea, but then to to be able to to adapt it and um, this includes for sure also unforeseeable human needs. So, so we need new technology that we can build something today. Um, yes, to, to have a building that is never becoming obsolete. So we never want to want to trash it, but at least um, recover the, the existing elements and, and maybe be able to, to reshape the, the, the building layout or something or adapt it to different needs. Thank you. So before coming to a final uh, question round, I would like to ask you where and how do we find this balance between a sustainable structure for many, many, many years and this flexibility for being adaptive for whatever will happen? Nobody was expecting a COVID-19 and now we're in the midst of a situation that changes our life. That can happen in five years again, in 10 years again, with something that we cannot uh, foresee today. So how do you find this balance between a very long lasting structure and this flexibility without producing short term waste? We will stay with the laws now. And now for the final round, uh, let's assume you will have the power in the next five minutes to design a law for the future. And Annette, in your lecture, you told us that the uh, um, recycling amount of concrete is limited, for example, to 40%. So that's the maximum that, that you're allowed to, uh, to recycle, which is for me a shocking uh, fact to hear that. I didn't know that. So just take this as an example. If you had the power to draw a law and to design a law for in the next five minutes, what would that law be when we look at a circular strategy on a small scale of products? So who would like to be government at the moment? Who would like to share his or her first idea? My first idea is uh, also looking to Denmark, perhaps, <laughs> uh, in some of these projects where they have to uh, implement 90% of reuse material in buildings, especially in this, uh, or in, and then in the circle house. This is the task to design, uh, design for disassembling, where 90% uh, you can reuse in, in further time. Okay. So perhaps this could be, I mean, this is a, just a, just an amount, yeah. yeah. So what would the specific law be then in a sentence? Um, for every new building or for com competitions, perhaps uh, this could be an, um, uh, an Oswald criterion, a point uh, to get the, the to win the, the competition. If you, I don't know, if you uh, uh, design the building with 90% is quite much, I would say, yeah. This is especially in this project. Let's start with the lower number. By law, a bit high, I know. Okay. So it's a bit provocating, perhaps, now the 90%, but uh, um, in fact, it could be a, a law. Thank you. So we have the first sentence of the new law. Uh, Lucas, Jan, Annette, who would like to continue with a second sentence? Um, maybe I can uh, join in. Um, it was also part of my presentation that you saw that over there past years, um, operational energy and carbon, for example, has been successfully reduced because we have rating schemes like Passive House or Minerchi in Switzerland or LEED and BREAM certifications. But they focus primarily on the operational demands. And what we've seen through, for example, load bearing systems, but also facade systems, windows and, and finishings, they contribute a lot through the embodied share. So, we have to extend these rating schemes to include more embodied shares. And then there will be directly um, incentives because, for example, you get a better rating, you can later sell your building easier. If you have, for example, a, a good rating in, in low embodied energy or and so on. And at the end, if these numbers are, are low 
it might not necessarily be that everything is reused because we've seen and sometimes it's not possible to reuse structural elements or they would be just too high but you had uh, too heavy but you can do a life cycle. very shortly so put it in a nutshell one yeah. sentence of a law so uh, include more the um, embodied environmental impact into um, sustainability rating schemes thank you that's good we can follow yeah. i would extend that to uh, say cost calculations have to also consider disposal and all, all subsequent say effects that are currently not um not listed in uh, in calculating the cost of a building of a new construction and i think once that is sort of somehow enforced to uh, to be taken into account by a customer by a client then i think also it will change the 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 value of uh of sustainable construction as what Annette was mentioning earlier that if you consider the amount of repair or the ease of repair through a dismantleable structure um it's uh it shows differently the cost it, at the end of the day it is not more expensive this building but in fact it's cheaper and more you know economically speaking uh, yeah more effective that idea with the money disposal, I think this would completely change building industry and would completely change all the toxic uh, waste that we put into the buildings today. So thank you very much for your ideas, for sharing in and for the first panel where we were talking about small scale. Uh, we now go into the lunch break at, and see you again at 2 p.m. So in uh, almost an hour. Uh, where we will continue to talk on the medium scale and focus on architecture, on build projects and on uh, project ideas. Thank you very much. See you again at the Circular Strategy Symposium.